We're going to take the grades we learned this morning, hardwood lumber grades, NHLA grades, and we're going to translate that to the sawing process. Now, one of the most obvious things that I think will become apparent to you quick is that if you're trying to get FAS lumber out of a log that's eight foot long, and you've got to do something with a three by seven foot long cutting, or a four inch wide by five foot long cutting, they don't come from an eight foot long log very well. And it really shows that if you're going to be selling lumber by grade, you need to have a little bit of control over the length of log coming in to you. You can't make something out of nothing. And if you're trying to get a five foot or a seven foot long cutting out of a knot that's anywhere but in the end of an eight foot log, it doesn't work. Okay, so there's a real thing to be said for if you're buying logs from a logger of giving him a little bit of a premium to give you longer logs because he does lose a little bit on scale by, saw, by bucking up trees into long logs. He can make more scale, have more volume cutting a 16 into 2 eighths and selling it as a 16. But that's not going to help you with your grade. And remember the other side of grade that helps you with the longer logs is the higher your surface measure, the more of those cuttings you can take to get the percent clear. Okay, the thing that throws me quickest is when I have a 12 inch wide board that is 16 foot long and it looks like a two common and doggone it with the number of cuttings you get and with the room in between the knots you can get an FAS out of the thing. You know, really by having the more flexibility by more cuttings to take and having more flexibility by more length of lumber to put it into, you get more out of it. So if you're going to grade saw, you want to start the process, you want to think about grade when it's in a tree form before you buck it up into the log form. After that, we've got to start looking at the defects on the log. Now again, you've got a little bit of an of a advantage over a conventional mill because you get to see these logs up close and personal two, three times before you saw them sometimes. Especially if you're working with them with a PV. You've got an automatic loading system, well that saves your back. But don't forget, as that log is rolling onto the carriage, you want to fix in your mind where all the defects are so that you can make the right decisions for grade sawing. Grade sawing is nothing but turning that circular log into a square and then sawing further but you want to do so to work around the knots. When we start talking about grade sawing, we start using the, the terminology of faces. A face is that flat side of a log that you get after you slab it off. Since we take everything down into a, a square or rectangular form, you have four faces on that square or rectangle, one on each side of the log. It's very important, and most of the decision making, right or wrong, is done when you slab off that first slab, because that fixes all four faces. They're, you're done with, it's a deal. The surface defects are obviously the indicators of the knots or defects in your lumber later. You have to get used to judging what's a defect on the bark and how that translates into a defect on your lumber. It depends on species. Different species react differently and heal differently over defects. Butternut, for instance, if you've got a defect on the outside, you know it's going to open up and look terrible on the inside. Butternut happens to have a problem with a fungus that prevents it from healing well over old branch scars. Uh, soft maple, red maple is another one that tends to have more of a problem underneath the surface defect or distortion of the bark than you expect. Heart maple on the other time, side, or, or, or sugar maple as we call it, it generally heals fairly well over old scars and, the, and you sometimes have some nice clear lumber even though you've got a little bit of a distortion in the bark. You have to learn species by species and again, the best way to learn is by doing. Pay attention to what you see on the outside of the log and how it translates to the inside. So we're going to take that log and as we're rolling it in to the carriage, we're going to pay attention to where all the defects are so that we open that log up 
and make the first cut in the right place. Okay, we've got a log here that I want to talk about for a second. We've got some knots that seem to run fairly much in a straight line. We've got three in a straight line along the top, two in a straight line along here, and in the top instance, we've got the option of trying to solve that log based on clear faces, where we find a couple faces that have no knots whatsoever in them. We open the open face of the log, generally opening up the worst face and not sawing deeply, but just getting a bearing surface on that worst face. And then going and working the lumber off the clear faces. On the bottom one, figure we took that same log and we sawed it by positioning the knots so that they ended up being on a couple faces but on the edge of those faces and the results translate out of the first log based on sawing finding two clear faces and then putting the knots in the other two the first face turned out to be a one common the second face turned out to be a one common. The third face turned FAS lumber. And the fourth face turned FAS lumber. Because we opened that committing face. We opened a bad one or one of the worst faces. But it turned two faces into being totally clear. And the other one, as I mentioned, we put the knots in between or on the edges between faces. Sure, they affected two faces. But they were able to be edged off of the lumber. The result was a little bit narrower board, but we ended up with the first, second, third, and fourth face all yielding FAS lumber. Back, back it up on that one. Okay, question is to back it up once more and explain it one more time? Yeah. Okay, let's look at the log again for a second. This happened to be a log where the knots seemed to follow fairly straight lines. There were five knots on the log that, that you could see. And those knots could be positioned one of two ways. In the top way, we based it on clear faces. The person decided that since there were, since there were no knots on the number four face, there were no knots on the number three face, that that's where he was going to get all his grade lumber and he was going to dump those remaining knots on the number two face and the number three face where they ended up being about in the center of those two faces. The, uh, he, he did right with that in mind. You, you slab off to get a bearing surface to go against the, the carriage or the deck of your, your saw, one of the bad faces, and then flip it over to work off of one of the opposing faces that's good and saw that deeply. But what he really should have done was position these knots on the corner between faces. See how this one fell on a corner and this one fell on a corner and these three ended up being able to fall on the corner. This is an instance of putting the knots to where they can be edged off the boards. It's something you do when your knots follow fairly straight lines and they're spaced so that they can end up being on the corners of those faces. And the end result was that even though we edged a little bit of material off, by positioning it on the edges of the faces, we ended up with four FAS faces. Maybe we lost 20% uh, on the quantity of lumber we got out of that, but when the price jumped up from a one common price to an FAS price, we gained 40% in value. So 40% minus a little bit, we made money. Making that decision probably made the difference of maybe uh, $15, $20, maybe $25 on that log depending upon the diameter. Just opening it up properly. Now granted, not all of them are, are that simple, but there are some other things that we can work on. If you're sawing a log with just a few defects, again it depends on how, they straight, how straight of a line those defects are. Sometimes, like in the bottom one, these defects ended up being not in a straight line, so you might as well dump that type of defect into one face. You, because if we put the, this dotted line being the corner between two faces down here, we'd be removing maybe 40% of each board in order to get 40% more value on the lumber, and it's a wash. 
We don't want to do it. So when the knots, when there's not a lot of knots, we still want a grade saw. We, we try to dump them, and they're in a the diagonal. We try to dump them onto one face, so we only lose one of those faces. Again, here's another example where all the defects fell on one face. You put it on the carriage, you slab off that face, just one slab. After that point, you take and put that down on the carriage or against the, the blocks so that you can keep working off that true face for the rest of the time. Okay, most portable band mills have, have made adaptations to where you can taper saw. Taper saw is, is being able to jack up one end of the log so that your saw line, the, the direction the saw is heading is parallel to the bark of the wood. The reason for doing that is we know that most of the good quality lumber is where? Well, it's, it's along the outer edge. Why throw it away in a slab that's tapered? We want to keep most of the good material that we possibly can into the boards. So we saw parallel to that face. So in the case of that board that had the defects grouped in one face that I just showed you, we slab that off, but we don't need to taper saw that edge. We know the knots are there, the knots are going to affect us right away. We slab that right off so that we got a bearing, long enough bearing surface to lay down, and then we're done with that face for right now. Then the remaining face that's clear opposite that is going to end up being uh, sawn parallel to the first face and also parallel to the bark on that side, and we're not even using the taper set to pull it off. It, it depends on how much taper there is, sometimes you still play with it. What about a what about most logs? No. What about the logs that have sweep? Well, unfortunately trees don't always grow straight and we do have to play with logs that have sweep. Best thing to do is to, to try to get your lumber off the side of the log where the sweep isn't affecting your cut. Because you notice the bottom of this you may take a couple real short boards off of here before you get into this slab. But the problem with this is, is that the center is going to get into that poor portion of the log fast. And that's the worst place to have defects in a short log because you can't get the cuttings around either side. Defects in the ends aren't a big deal. I can find cutting length around them. But the ones that fall right here a third of the way in are the absolute worst. The second worst place to have a knot is dead center. Again, trying to find places to get these cuttings around it to make your grade. So this face here isn't going to yield you a whole lot. So you're going to end up slabbing these faces off, getting what you can. This one will get slabbed off heavy and tossed. This one here, you'll get a couple short boards out and slab it in. But then you're going to work your grade off the outer edges. Because even if you see some defects there, you're not going to run into the defects that you can't see in the center of the log, which was where they're going to be. The tree had limbs at one time or another in its life when it was smaller. And you're going to get into them a lot slower when you work these off. Sure, you get a board that's, that's got quite a twist to it. But if you've got an edger and you start putting a line to that, it's amazing what you can get out of it. It really is. In the sawmill yesterday, there was this real this log had crook. It didn't even have sweep. Crook is a real violent sweep. And uh, I wondered what they were going to get out of it. And that edgerman put lines on that that just amazed me at the board he pulled off of it. So don't be afraid of the fact that that is going to have a hook on those boards. You can get more out of it than you think you can get out of it. So that's, that's a recommended way for logs that have sweep. What about logs that have seams? Well, it depends what type of seam it is. Two things make a difference in seams, whether they're straight or spiral, and whether there's decay associated with the seam. Some seams like frost cracks that open up for just a, a real short period of time and then close back again, quite often don't have a lot of decay associated with them, especially if they're in a species like a hard maple. Uh, soft maple is a little bit different. But those seams that don't have a lot of decay, don't have a lot of swelling, that are straight, the best thing in the world to do is to push, position them on the corner between two faces and just edging them off. You're not, if there's no decay associated with it to speak of, you're not going to edge much of the board off 
You're going to get the most amount of material out of the first few boards that you can before the seam works into that face further. And that's where your grade is, that's where your value is, and that's where you want to be anyway. So put it on the edge. A spiral seam is a whole other beast. A spiral seam is going to be a problem unless there's a whole lot of defects other places. You want to put that in, commit it all on one face, slab that face first. Don't slab it too heavy, slab it enough to get a good bearing surface and then work your grade lumber off the rest of the log. So I pretty much told you how to first commit a face and I've explained where to go from there after, after making the slab. But how do we decide how deep to saw into the log? Well, actually that's easier than what you'd think. Remember I told you you, you sort of memorize what each face looks like so you don't have to keep turning the log or if you forget and you've got an automatic turner you roll it over once to remember but you you saw first your worst face then you start into your best face and saw that as deeply into the log until the grade of that face turns worse than the next face you have to work with okay because if you saw a face too deep and you're getting lower quality lumber, lower value lumber, lower grade lumber off that face, you're, you might be robbing volume from the edge of a board that has better grade to it. Let's keep the good lumber, the good volume on the good boards. So let's not saw any deeper with a face than it turns worse in grade than the next face. Now here's the trick. Remember NHLA grading, we're grading most of the time from the worst side of the board. So you've got to be a little bit of a mind reader, a log reader, where you're looking at the green of that and you're guessing what's going to be on the back side of the board because that's going to determine your grade. And what you look for is you look for those patterns where the bark starts to make, not the bark, where the annual rings, where the design makes a, a circular ring. You know it's getting close to a knot then. How close that is to a ring means how quick that knot's going to come. And you've got to learn to gauge your eye based on that. You may take a piece of four quarter if it's a big ring instead of a piece of six quarter. Uh, or you may end up turning to the next face because you know the back side is going to look terrible. And it's a, it's a matter of guessing when to turn based on what you guess the back face or worst face of that board is going to be. Of course, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, the worst face of the board is the one oriented where you can't see it. It'd be a lot easier if you could, but you can. It's the one further inside the log because it's closer to that non-quality zone, the younger part of the tree. So memorize your faces, work off the faces. Obviously, this is the textbook approach. Just like NHLA grades, there are exceptions to everything. Any of you who have been sawing for some time know all the cute things that can happen to logs because of tension and because of stress. The ones that are most documented are the ones of the trees that grow on the side hill. They have tension wood, they have compression wood in them. They do cute things when you saw them. Sometimes the board will come and bow out so much it comes back and hits you. You swear. They just, just unbelievable. And what happens when a tree grows on a side hill at an angle, the tree does some real neat things of growing annual rings faster on one side of the tree and thicker on one side of the tree than the other. If you look you know, obviously when the log comes into you, you can't tell whether it grew straight or it grew crooked until you look at the end of the log. You look at the end of the log and, and look at the annual rings. If the path or dead center of the log is lopsidedly to one side, you know you got something real neat going to happen when you saw that log. The, uh, if this is the end of the log, And the dead center is over here, and your annual rings are real tight on this side, but real open on this side. That was a tree's way of reacting to growing on a side hill. And one side of this log has a different density from being compressed, while the other side has a lighter density and, and has been stretched all its life. And, and the, the one side reacts a whole lot different than the other. And if you put both of them into the same face, they can do cute things. Or if you work with them independently, they can do cute things. 
how do you saw a log like this? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a miracle worker, guys. <laughs> there, it, it's hard to work with, um, and it's hard to deal with. There's, that's the extreme case. Now you've got other cases that aren't that extreme, but result from the same forces coming to play in a log, where a log that grew a little bit on a side hill, or even sometimes logs that came from trees that grew with trees around maybe three sides of it, and it had to put all of its limbs on one side. Just the way that those limbs can cause some tension compression wood in the tree that can make some really neat things happen. When it's not very pronounced, when it's not real bad, there are some tricks you can do. What you'll have is you'll have the log and you slab off a nice straight cut on one side and that, that can't will actually <coughs> bend. The, the entire log that's left on your carriage will actually stop being straight and will, will stretch out the other side. In those cases, sometimes you have to go and work lumber off the other side of the log to equalize your tension and equalize your stresses that are happening in the log. You sometimes can't grate saw is what I'm trying to tell you. Sometimes you have to take a log like that and work evenly off of each face and work it down as fast as you safely can because the longer you let it sit, the more of those forces are going to be twisting that log. On a circular sawmill or a high production mill, they don't have as much problem with that because they're sawing so darn fast. Those forces are there, they're trying to bend it, but they aren't given the time. The mill I was in yesterday was a double cup band mill and it was cutting on both throws of the carriage and those logs weren't on there long at all. And they were able to work down that type of thing without a major problem. On a portable band mill, you're sawing slower. It gives those forces time to do cute things and you need to work it out a little bit more. Uh, sometimes wind stress will do this to an entire stand of trees. If it's exposed to prevailing wind off of a lake uh, and these trees are constantly being beat by one side with the wind whipping down through the lake and hitting them, that you'll have a whole batch of logs that'll want to do this. And you almost throw grade sawing out the window and you start working each side of the log down evenly, rolling the log many, many times. But you can cheat a bit. Try to get a little more off the good sides when you're doing it. But the key is, is no matter what quality the lumber is, it's got to be straight. It can't be tapered on the ends down to nothing. And you got to make boards. And uh, with some logs, you just give up and you make boards and other logs you, you work hard and you make great. Uh, in that vein, what do we do with a log that has lots of knots all over it? Well, that was a live sawing that I showed you of, of sawing from one end to the other and getting it off your carriage so that you can spend more time on the great logs and you can put your time where you're going to get a better return on your investment on those logs that are good. There's a saying that an old sawmiller told me uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. He said, you know, it's hard to pay too much for a good log or too little for a poor log. And when you start seeing the difference in price from FAS lumber to three common lumber, you start seeing where that really comes true. Where you get those poor quality logs, they're only going to yield two and three common lumber at $400 a thousand. It's hard to pay too little for that when you start taking off the top of that the cost of cut, skid, haul, and saw. Um, you know, it, it's got to cost the logger at least 120 bucks a thousand to cut and skid, depending on how far he's going to haul. Another couple, another twenty dollars or more. Uh, you, there you've got, you know, 140, uh, another 140 to saw, uh, or more if you're doing it in a portable band mill. It, basis, you're only turning $400 a thousand lumber out of it, or less, $200 a thousand lumber. It's really a case where the guy ought to pay you to take the log from him if you're going to saw it and you want to break even. The other side of the coin are those logs that yield just phenomenally. Uh, one of the things we, we put in this, the announcement was how different logs affect, uh, the species affects the way you can saw and affects the grade. Uh, there's this term foresters use, it's called shade tolerance. Some trees tolerate shade more than others. Uh, those trees that tolerate shade are the ones we find in real old forest stands because all the trees have grown up in the shade of other trees, hard maple, hemlock, tolerate shade real well. Spruce is another one. 
Uh, but because they tolerate shade, it means they don't shade their branches off as fast and you run into branches sooner. There are some trees we call shade intolerance. Those are the trees that grow up in open fields, grow up when a big tree falls over and a lot of sunlight hits the ground in a forest. Those are the trees that do not deal well with shade and shade their branches off fairly fast. Ash, black cherry, uh, an intermediate one that's not is in between is, is red oak. Sometimes it'll grow up in, a, in an open setting and if it grows up real tight, you'll end up having a lot of clear wood on the outside. Those are the ones you can pay some pretty good bucks for. You gotta, you gotta be able to read those logs and know what you're gonna get off of it. Take into account the species that it is and how quickly it probably healed over the branches and, and take that all into account. But you're not gonna make money sawing real poor quality logs all the time. There's a reason that the, the sawmills don't take them and they're available out there and you don't want them either, guys. It takes you longer to saw them than it does a sawmill. Even though you have less overhead, you still aren't gonna make the money. You're better off going for the higher quality logs. Uh, the niches you ought to be into is working with loggers for those short logs, the six foot logs that they can't put, can't sell at a sawmill because the sawmill is not gonna buy anything less than eight foot four or eight foot six and, and work with them that way. Take those short logs that come out of a crotch tree or above a crotch and uh, buy them off the landing if you're gonna buy logs and work with those because they generally have some, some really nice clear lumber on those short butts. Uh, that's just, just a suggestion. If you're working for other people and they're bringing logs into you, then it's not that much of a big deal. It's they're, they're taking the loss or they're taking the gain and you're just doing a contract job of turning a round thing into a rectangular thing. Uh, but you want customers and you want happy customers, you'll do great sawing for them when they need it, and you'll do it right. Uh, hopefully they'll appreciate it or learn to appreciate it if you have the knowledge, you have the understanding, and you do a better job. Do I have any questions at this point? Yeah? The short logs, taking into account that a log shorter than eight foot has a very limited market for it, you don't have to pay a whole lot to the guy. Um, you can find the, the rules, every log rule can be calculated down to a six foot log very easily and you can buy them on scale. Uh, but you, like I say, you don't have to pay a lot. You can tell the guy you do have the problem when you get down to six foot that, that you're only gonna turn out select lumber at the best. But if it's a nice clear six foot lo log, you can turn out a whole lot of select lumber. And the neat thing about the market right now is that select lumber isn't worth only a little bit less than FAS lumber. Uh, generally, if you're talking to mill and you're gonna, I'm gonna buy lumber on a wholesale basis, it's hard for me to buy all FAS lumber. They, they want to sell me select and better. They want to group it into one thing. You get the select, you get the better, it comes with a batch. And that's uh, why the prices are so close is because they're really getting to be one grade, give it another five years and maybe FAS will be combined with select to make life a little bit simpler for everybody. The, uh, the other approaches that I want to work with you on, I've got maybe another 10 minutes here. I want to talk a little bit about edging and trimming the boards before I wrap up. Edging and trimming hardwood lumber. This is something I use when I do uh, sawmill employee training. I go into sawmills sometimes and work with their people on how to edge and how to trim. This is sort of a rehash of the lumber grades that we picked up earlier, but it's, it's translating them to the board. If you've got the ability, you've got an edger off of your mill, you can do some neat things by edging and trimming everything properly. Here's some examples. The first one, and I'm gonna explain these for you people in the back that I don't expect to be able to read all of these. We've got a 12 foot long board here that on one side only has five foot of wane that has no defects whatsoever in it. That board is okay as it is not to be edged more. Why? Because FAS lumber allows six foot of wane on each side of a 12 foot long board. Here we've got another 12 foot long board that has three and a half foot on one side and four foot on the other. That's no problem whatsoever. That, that six foot on each side of a 12 foot board can be on both sides of the boards. The boards are looked at, the sides of the boards or the edges are looked at independently. Here's a 12 foot long one that did not get edged enough. 
It's seven foot long of wane on a 12 foot long board. It should go back and be re-edged. The difference of that is, uh, you know, it's a three, four dollar fix. By taking a little bit of more material off that, you'll make three or four dollars on that lumber, especially on that board, especially with it being eight foot surface measure. Here's number two. When you edge pieces that will make clearer, nearly clear lumber, again, we're trying for FAS, that are only four or five inches wide. Remember that the wane restrictions are much tighter, that we're adding the wane on both edges, and that the wane can't go in too far. This 12 foot board has three foot here, two foot here for a combination of six foot. It barely makes it. It was edged perfectly. Here's another 12 foot long board that has four here on this side, three foot on this side. It's got one foot too long a wane. It's a one common board the way it is. You only have to take off a little bit to make it upgraded. Here's a board that has a problem. The wane on those narrow boards cannot be more than a third of the width. Okay, in this case, I don't like this diagram because it's gotten too heavy when I copied it on the photocopier. Actually, if I add the width of this and the width of this, it's more than a third of the piece and it would not make it, even though the diagram says it does. This one here has got weighing on the edges both opposing each other that when added together are over a third of the width and doesn't make it. Here's one on the bottom. If you've got a board that's already four inches wide and it's got too much weighing on it to make a select board, you can't edge it because if you edge it and it drops below that three and three quarters, then you're not going to make the grade anyway. So you're taking it off to try to make a one common board, an FA, a select board, by getting the wane off, but you shoot yourself in the foot because you lose out because you lost the minimum width on the other end. So when you get down to four inches, you know that there's not a whole lot you can do with edging that board without hurting yourself. Okay, so in this board you don't want to do anything uh, unless the option is of having it trimmed off shorter so you trim it off the end, it has a wane, you knock that 12 foot board down to an, to an 11, and then the, the wane isn't going but exactly half the distance, five and a half foot on an 11 instead of six and a half foot on a 12. So you can't fix everything with an edger, sometimes you have to fix it with a trimmer. Here's some things we can do with a trim saw or you can do with a chainsaw on your, having a chainsaw around to trim up uh, it's not unusual at all for a sawmill, even though they have trim saws that are automatically double ending, not automatically, but they're double end trimming their lumber, to also have down on the green chain after grading uh, a chainsaw. They happen to have uh, a small steel saw, chainsaw at the mill I was working at yesterday, and uh, sometimes the graders will want some more trimmed off the board, they'll mark it, the guys will just buzz it off with a chainsaw. And this is a high production mill, so there's no reason that you can't do it with a chainsaw too. Here's some options where we've got a 12 foot long board, it's got 8 inches wide with 7 foot of wane on the top edge. We've got to take a foot off of that board in order to drop it down and, and that'll give us uh, the opportunity or, you know, if we can't edge it to, to get it shorter. Another example here down at, at the next one is don't forget your last lineal foot rule where you've got to have the boards less than 25 percent in unsound defects. Remember you've got to have it 50 percent clear in the last lineal foot of FAS and at least 25 percent sound. That leaves you only 25% of the board that can be unsound, or sometimes you need to trim off the end of a board in order to make the grade. Again, looking at narrow four and five inch wide boards in this last example. We've got the option here uh, of trimming this board. As it is, the board does not make it because it's got three foot on one edge and four foot on the other edge, which in a narrow board you add both edges. You've got seven foot on a 12 foot board. You've got one foot too much. So that they're going to trim off the end so that the wane is only going to be uh, added together half the length of the board. Here's another one where the wane goes over a third of the width into the board. All you got to do is cut a foot back on that board. You're losing 
less than 10% of it and you're gaining 30, 40% in value, it's a no-brainer. It's easy to do and make money. All these examples, incidentally, are in with your handouts. This is a good one because it shows a couple of different things that I haven't covered before. Uh, here we've got a board 10 foot long, it has 23 inches of defects located from the end. Remember I told you sometimes at the end of a board it's easier to deal with defects than any other place. The defects do extend more than 2 twelfths of the board. You can go 2 feet or 24 inches on a 12 foot long board. This is only a 10 foot long board. If you take 2, which is a 2 of the 2 twelfths, times 10 gives you 20 inches. Since the surface measure is less than 8, the 10 twelfths must be contained in one rectangle and trimming one foot off upgrades this board from a one comment to FAS. You don't have to take it all off, just one foot. Again, that therefore taking the one foot, even though notice in this board you're taking one foot and it's mostly all clear material, it still upgrades the board because it's leaving you less than two twelfths of the board of defects. So it seems odd taking clear material off the end and in the result having a board that's worth more money, but it works. Here's one that's got some defects, seven inches at one end, 10 inches at the other. You got 17 inches on a nine foot long board. We're looking at that two twelfths, you do two times nine, nine being again the length, has 18 inches. You're allowed 18 inches of defects in those two ends added together and still making two twelfths. So the board does make an FAS as it is with 17 inches. Don't trim it off, leave it the way it is. The last one, the board grays, FAS the way it is, the surface measures eight, so you can have two rectangles or two cuttings. The number of cuttings is surface measure over four for FAS if you look at your chart. We can have the two cuttings. You've got 18 inches, 22 inches, uh, adding this four inches on the end of defects. We can add them together since we're allowed to take two rectangles, it'll work. 2 times 12, which is your 2 twelfths, the 2 of the 2 twelfths times 12 foot gives you 24. You could have 24 inches of defects located in that board. You only have 22, leave it as it is, and it makes an FAS board. There's one thing that's not in these that I wanted to explain to you. One, one thing you're going to end up having almost all the time are boards that have over length in them. You're not going to have a double end trimmer or a trim saw to trim everything exactly to footage. That over length, while we do not consider that when we determine the surface measure of the board, the clear material in the over length can be used to determine the clear percentage of the board. Okay, is everybody follow me? If I've got a 12 foot, 8 inch long board and that 8 inches is totally clear, I can sketch my cutting all the way out to the end of that board and I can add the cutting units in that over length in to make it. Another neat thing about over length is that any wane that's in the over length can be disregarded. Okay? So you can choose to ignore the bad things in the over length and you can choose to use the good material in the over length in order to make grade. And that's a, a real neat thing about having lumber that's not end trim, is, is using that extra material. So it doesn't hurt you in pushing up the surface measure, but it does help you in pushing up the clear percentage of the board in order to make the grade. And it doesn't hurt you if there's material in the over length or, or something in the over length that is not acceptable and knocks you out by grade, such as an oversized knot. It can be ignored. The uh, other thing that I want to tell you about, about overlength that works out well too is the, the, any split that's in the overlength is disregarded and you only start measuring the split to see if it's 12 inches or longer when it's within that. So you don't have to trim that off all the time and you can use that to your benefit in making your grade. Any questions about that? That's good. I'm right on schedule. 
Scott wanted to have 15 minutes or so to talk to you and uh, I pretty much wrapped things up. The neat thing about this afternoon is that we'll be available. We'll be working together on deciding when to turn the logs and where to find the grade of the logs on the mill. So thank you very much everybody. Thank you.